Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piskor. We're going to look at a classic, Scott McCloud's first comic, Zot Number 1 from Eclipse Comics. But before we dive into that, Ed, tell us about Red Room. Well, first off, let me just let's see what these look like together, because that Zot <laughs> is a wholesome looking feller. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the lineage here, I think. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. And these comics are going to start coming out. You know, it's May right now as of this recording. And uh, from this recording a couple weeks from now, first issue is going to see the light of day. Uh, first issue, 64 pages. Man, that's triple the size of your average comic that you get from Marvel and DC. And the cool thing about uh, the horror comics of Red Room are that uh, each issue, completely self-contained, man. So that's the cover for issue two. This is the cover for issue three. Recently just co finished a cover for issue four. All of this stuff can be ordered or pre-ordered on the Fantagraphics website at this very moment. You could get there through uh, my link tree in the description below this video, take you to the Fantagraphics site. And if you want to read the comics ahead of time, before these things hit paper, go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. And three bucks get you the entire archive of everything I have up there. Uh, over 100 pages of comics at this very moment. And I put new strips up every Tuesday. Also, uh, just real quick, also, uh, free comic book day is uh, August this year. Make sure your store gets a healthy supply of this. Uh, the Red Room free comic book day comic. PG Stories, man. So it's not going to get the, the, the store uh, closed down if you know anybody picks this up man but it's all original material and uh it all factors into the the red room comic so you want to get your hands on that join me on patreon at patreon.com slash jim rug where you can download my out of print hard to find zines and mini comics you can see lots of my original art and process uh, right now i'm doing a comparison between these two comics because they are the same story, but I drew them three years apart. We've looked at a lot of that stuff on, uh, you know, from other artists and other comics. It's another way to look at process stuff. So a lot of my Patreon is basically what I do with my life, yes. making comics, uh, answering Q&As, things of that nature. And many thanks to the cartoonist Kayfabe audience who have been joining my Patreon in droves over the last couple of months. Thank you very much for that support. And keep it up, patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. I will keep putting cool stuff up there. Thank you. But today, Ed, going to kind of look at a, uh, a bit of a classic. Scott McCloud, obviously one of the big, influential, thoughtful comics makers of our lifetime. And uh, this is where he begins, at least as far as what I have access to. Sure, yeah. And uh, one thing that's noteworthy, 1984. So it's just before, you know, the glut uh, in the, on the market of comics mm -hmm. and black and white comics specifically. This is a color comic coming out from Eclipse. There's a big, you know, not to skip ahead too much, but I think it's worth mentioning that context. This is Eclipse Comics, um, Jan and Dean Mullaney, talking about, like, uh, where they're at as a company. That it started in the late 70s, and it, up to this point, now are publishing a number of monthly color books in 1984, uh, along with a lot of other things. You know, it was a pretty big operation for a long time through the 80s. Give some context to that. The interesting note for me is Zot's going to run, this is full color, Yeah. for the first 10 issues. And uh, along with some of their other stuff, then cuts back to black and white. So maybe they expanded a little bit too quickly, uh, or maybe the market does become saturated, and they've got to cut back a little bit in some of their production costs. But it makes for an interesting series, because you get both a color monthly for a year, and then you get your black and white uh, issues, because I think it publishes a total of 36 issues of Zot over um, from 84 till about 1990. It's the black and white stuff that is uh, collected in the big guys at like Harper Collins mm -hmm. uh, uh, phone book, uh, you know, edition of Zot. So this stuff uh, is actually the first time I'm reading these early color uh, pieces, which, which is very fun. Uh, we see right here, we see uh, Kurt Busiek's uh, name, and I recently listened to the, the Brian Hibbs Scott McCloud conversation, and he's he being Scott McCloud cites Kurt Busiek for even being the guy to get Scott McCloud into comics in the first place. They went to school together, right. high school together. Uh, Scott McCloud, son of an engineer, I guess, or a professor or something. Smarty Pants dad. Yes, it makes sense. And uh, he he was a chess player growing up, and it was Kurt who introduced him to uh, to comics, and McCloud was you know, became interested a, a little bit. It was when he started to see stuff like Eisner and things like this where he 
started to lean into the formalism, the formalist aspects of the medium. Uh, if the guy is getting into comics at a late date, he's kind of drawing at a late date and not taking drawing seriously for a real long time. So he freely admits that the drawing is not e does not come easy to him. It's pretty rough. But the thing that I did notice while reading this is that his stuff, incredibly clear and readable from day one. Yeah. Also one noteworthy thing when it comes to fandom of uh, the, 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 the sort of fandom um, precursor career that Scott McCloud and Kurt Busiek have. Uh, Kurt tagged me in a post on Twitter one time, man, years ago. It was like, dude, we did. Scott McCloud and I, we did X-Men Grand Design way before you. And it was like 10 page piece where it was just like all the montage sequences where basically Scott McCloud was drawing all the fun stuff that he yes. wanted to draw from X-Men and it was would just appear in some weird fandom uh, publication. So these guys have some lineage. I'm always I, jealous of these these guys that find like another comic buddy early in life. That's so so cool. That's that's one of the Malcolm Gladwell pieces that we don't talk about, which is the luck part. Yeah. You know, like ha having s somebody with you. And it was uh, Young Enough Days when uh, Scott McCloud was spelled M C C L E O D. Wow. Yeah. So this is a <laughs> kayfabe stage name. Fascinating. <laughs> Did not know that. Uh, I just wanted to read this opening because I think it's such a cool beginning. He's fought on a dozen worlds, rushed headlong into a hundred deadly battles, and saved the lives of thousands. His fame is spread like wildfire through the massive galaxy he calls home. Now another world will know his name. Now Zot comes to Earth. That's a pretty good opener. Um, and, you know, even starting with the cover, super dynamic of Zot flying at you, at the reader. So pretty exciting pack from the get-go. Todd Klein letter. I always like to point out a Todd Klein uh, appearance. And a little intro from Scott talking about futures, you know, and the idea. This is a very, I'm going to say optimistic. I don't know if that's the right word. If you think of what's coming in the 80s, the grim and gritty comics of the 80s, this is a really different tone. Yes, sir. You know, it feels like that kind of utopian future outlook. It's not a utopian future, exactly what we see, but it's tech, you know, and it's this bright, colorful stuff. A lot of, uh, like, an anime manga influence, and he talks about Tezuka being influential in this early stage. Isolate any of these panels with this girl and you don't know if it's a Kamiko Robotech comic, a Star Blazers adaptation, or Zot. You know, it has that Amera manga right. feel to it. And early. 84 is really early for that. Yeah, yeah. But, but still the same era of all that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. like we got Captain Harlock and we got Space Battleship Yamamoto and shit. So it existed on TV. Robotech existed in those old comics like you know you see this girl in that comic the other piece that's neat from the get-go is if it, it feels very mundane mm -hmm. um you know he grounds this in a very real place which i think is important if you then want to have fantastic elements if you want to have a future that looks different you need to show us a starting point and uh, and he does that well and out comes zot from this weird dimensional opening a boom tube if yeah. you will uh, that opens in front of our, our heroine. Zot comes flying out. She's like, what is going on here? This feels like understanding comics, doesn't it? Like some of the storytelling, like you mentioned, not just clear, but impactful at times. Like a lot of emphasis in this panel. We're going to see what she's seeing. The the formalist stuff here is, is, is here in a, very small drips and drabs. It's when we get to the black and white where you see all of his thoughts about comic storytelling on display. Like, I recommend everybody have that, uh, that Zot collection, like, in their, on their shelves, man, because it's his further thesis on all the stuff that he was thinking about uh, in understanding comics. Yeah, we also talk... Well, by the way, what she sees coming through is a charging cadre of robots that are in hot pursuit of Zot, and uh, he now needs to come to the rescue. He's supposed to be, like, her age or something... Uh, which is like 13 you know he's supposed to be a kid but he's pretty beefy he's very beefy that's a uh i actually went to school in middle school with the dude that was sort of like this he had been held back several grades <laughs> <laughs> but he, he looked like a dude man he did not look like the rest of us when we were playing football <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, what I was going to say is McLeod, you know, this is like his first issue. He's 23 he's at this point yeah. and uh, develops, you know, you talk about those later issues, Ed, and when you're starting to see some of the more formal, innovative stuff, think of how much, you know, he develops through his 20s. Absolutely. If this, if this he's runs 28. for like the next six years, you know, that's basically his 20s and uh, his playground. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's 23 here. And basically, like, this is super cool because... It, He's doing the same thing in both tiers mm -hmm. where he's accomplishing the same sort of amount of time is transpiring. But let's see what it looks like in one one image and then break it up. Yeah. These are point of view shots when you think about them. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, I'm impressed by she. She's just like, OK, so who are you? Not what the hell is going on with reality? It's just like, oh, OK. This neighborhood's more interesting than the last one I was living in. Yeah, like, you know, she was able to endure a young teenage life with that haircut, man, so no nothing surprises her any longer. I also, when I started reading comics, it was after, it would have been, you know, late 80s, and I didn't have a comic book store, so I was not getting Zot at the time. Mm -hmm. As I got to learn more about comics and, and, you know, interacted more, especially online, I would find, like, these descendants of the Zot fans you know you could find them they were they were people who early adopted manga they were people that were looking for something other than the boys club of comics and zot is one of those comics that fit that it was something that uh girls might read um younger readers might read you know all of these groups that weren't necessarily being served by watchmen and dark knight zot was one of those books that just appealed to that as being different and alternative and even a different attitude on these pages and these color pages are pretty nice, man. For early 80s, very attractive. This is the kind of thing I would hope I would have picked up if I were going to comic book shops just because I'm sure nothing else looked like this. Yeah, for sure. So we get to into Zot's backstory. Now that he's we've had our opening action bit, now he's going to explain a little bit who he is and where he comes from. And uh, by the way, he's from Earth. Yeah. Which is very confusing, but it's great for a reader because now I've got questions. The distant future of 1965, as we will find out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really narrative hooks, though, to have those kind of bits of knowledge dropped that it's like, okay, we'll get back to that because I'm going to need some. I'm going to need more information than that. Neil, Neil Gaiman would talk about it like whenever he started Sandman was uh, you, you throw some softballs up in the air in case uh, future time comes, you got to turn in your script or something. You left this dangling thread. Let's make a story about that. Yeah, manga artists will talk that way too. You know, you got to got to get these balls rolling, yeah. and then maybe gravitate to the ones that people are responding to, and so on. So we get their introduction. You get to learn a little bit about both of them. In their exchange, we learn that the gun was down to its last bullet, and one more robot survived due to circumstances. Uh, Jenny has to be the hero there. So we get to see a little bit of her in action. She's going through the Joseph Campbell gimmicks here, man. Yes, absolutely. Again, great for any reader because now we have young male protagonist, young female protagonist. Who do you identify with? Zot, Zot's going to gonna be, uh, will work for all of you. Yeah, take your, take your pick. A little more formalism. Yes, love this kind of stuff. This is something I used to do um, early in my comics, and I still do to some extent where you're just playing. It's like, how do you make the page exciting? Yeah. Somebody's tripping and stumbling, let's trip up on your panel. Very subtle, doesn't interfere with readability at all, just makes your page a little more interesting. And that's her, her big brother, who, uh, of course, you can't have everything just working smoothly. So he joins them, and through this, uh, I call it a boom tube, but through this portal, once again, they travel, and now they're in Zot's weird earth and uh in trouble by the way yeah th there's a key that's a macguffin for this whole story and the brother had the key the reason the girl was running from the brothers because she stole it off of him after hearing the importance of the key so that's that's the object that's going to get us from point a to b through these 30 pages that we're reading here and uh of course now that they're in the future or in Zot's world, Zot comes to the rescue of our falling, uh, falling Jenny in this new world. Pretty, uh, pretty exciting way to make an impression. You can see the bond that's going to form between these two main characters right away. She saves his life. Two pages later, he saves hers. You, you see it. You see it here with the eyebrows and the eye, and you see it here with the eyebrows and the eye. Uh, it almost is like one of those like uh, Snapchat filters where you can uh, have the double eyes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Thicken up those brows just a touch. Thicken them up too much, though, and you're going to lose the double eye. 
Well, exactly. Yeah, you want to lose the double eye. Uh, I see what you're saying. You can even triple it up with the mouth. <laughs> the way he's drawing features is... Um, I wonder what he is looking at. You know, like manga makes sense because I don't know American cartoonists that are drawing uh, a face that way. For sure, for sure. And and it's almost like already he's at that point of like that thing that we all remember from understanding comics where you distill the face down into its like most simple simple shapes and forms so that the characters could be as identifiable as possible. Yeah, I wonder how conscious he was of that at this stage. If yeah. that's a happy accident that he then, you know, kept delving into and figures out or if it's something that he's conscious of already this early on how about these like beautiful cityscapes and backgrounds and stuff he's, he's really awesome at that feels very european to me sure yeah i wonder what he's reading comics wise you know we, we we know manga seems to be on these pages to some degree but now we're seeing like the european sci-fi maybe heavy metal or something that he's looking at and just the way this book is set up this is not a guy that's just looking at marvel and dc comics absolutely not absolutely not and i mean he's he came to comics super late, and he's a very literate, smart guy who's bringing in a million outside resources. Now, you know, Kurt Busiek is taking him down to the gutter, man, by making him read, you know, X-Men comics or whatever. But, you know, he got something out of that, too. There are a lot of uh, moments throughout this comic where he's very dynamic, like this kind of stuff. This happens several times where he's able to create both depth and movement. Uh, pretty good for, you know, a young guy who, as you say, Ed, comes to comics late maybe and is not as obsessed with the art part of it, but he's still able to do a lot on these pages. Um, in some cases, I think that actually plays better to a casual reader. So Zod goes to this, like, ruling body because he thinks he's found this key that is a source of conflict in his in his world. Uh, this is the guy from, like, the representative from the world that is missing the key. And he's kind of here throwing his weight around and talking tough. And Zot's going to save the day, except for one small thing. In the course of all of these uh, adventures, she has lost the key. It is a series. We need an issue, <laughs> too. Yeah. Uh, but you also pack it with action. So in the middle of this meeting, someone shows up who's uh, causing trouble. I can't remember if he's actually from the same world that has the missing key or if this is another subplot that's being established. But he has a ray gun that's turning people he shoots into monkeys. <laughs> so you have to contend with that. Also, there's a robot butler named Robbie. Yeah, yeah. Very Art Deco inspired and very cool. Yeah, one of those future elements and does the driving since Zot is like 13. Underage. Man, he should be playing quarterback on uh, Jenny's local football Can't team. Can't even get a driver's license in Montana to run a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> and conveniently, our bad guy is standing on top of a tile that says emergency sub-zero extinguisher unit. 1991 Wonder Man colors there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so Zot dis disbands him from shooting that, that <laughs> weirdly Man. positioned extinguisher unit. Right. And uh, that's about about the uh, wrap-up. You know, we've established all of these various pieces. The key is still the thing we're looking for. We've got the wor different worlds established that we'll be visiting as we go on throughout Zot. And it ends, uh, her, her big brother got turned to a <laughs> monkey. Yes, some humor. Some, uh, so, some humor, uh, also a different tone for a lot of the comics that were coming out at this time. And you see your next issue splash page here. Beautiful lettering. It's a good looking comic. It's a really good looking comic when you think 23 years old, first comic he's really making. I love seeing a Destroyer Duck ad, Destroyer Duck, a comic that we will be looking at at some point. Um, but a uh, pretty interesting snapshot of comics history for 1984 and for outside of our you know, Marvel DC mainstream comics publishers. This really is kind of a unique piece. We, we've we heard the term uh, from, oddly enough, m the British guys that we interviewed, gr ground level mm -hmm. comics. And Eclipse, pretty solid ground level publisher, man. And this this fits the bill. It's not, it's not outrageous. It's not insane. It's not over the top. Uh, but it's also not Marvel or DC schlock. Yeah. Other places that we've seen him, McLeod, is in like our 1986 Amazing Heroes doing mini comic reviews in the back. One of the features that he would run in the back of Zod as he gets a little more formally experimental are Matt Fiesel, uh backup strips. He, he would do these stick figures. 
even gave him an entire issue. So issue 14 and a half is going to be Matt Fazell taking over the main piece and doing the further adventures of Zot in dimension 10 and a half, which is the stick figure world. Kind of an oddity, but speaks to what McLeod is uh, doing and, and sort of exploring as the series you know, as he gets his footing, as he kind of starts to really get a grasp of what he's making. This is 1987, so three years into this run, about halfway through the Zot run, uh, you see McLeod just really kind of a confident visionary and, uh, and, and all that may entail, which in this case, giving your book over to your backup artist to do a style that's very different than what uh, readers are used to. I love uh, this this era of comics. I mean... Growing up in the 90s, and this was my recent past and stuff that I could find. Man, this is my heart. I think about, like, basically everybody who drew a Munden's Bar backup feature. That's a good call they, for this. They, 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 they own a place in my heart, man. And I, I think both of these guys might have had a piece there. I certainly love the uh, Matt Fiesel Munden's Bar backup because he draws more uh, realistic-looking comics, which... You know, you don't see anywhere else. Yeah. Um, the last piece I would say about this is young adult. One of the, the giant genres today, this would fit right into the young adult genre. And uh, Yeah, that's good to know because I have no idea what the fuck that word means. Decades before that was a thing that was being used to sell all kinds of stuff. That's all I've got for Zot number one, Ed. Although I did enjoy looking through this and would not be opposed to looking at more Zot issues. That that black and white is a very substantial thing. We could talk about it in a, a formalist aspect uh, in, in, a, in a big way. So, yeah, there's going to have to be more Zot coverage. Shouts to Scott McCloud for contributing the things that he did to the, to the medium. Broadening the landscape. And a heck of a start for a young cartoonist that got uh, sort of interested in the game uh, much later than your usual cartoonist. Good to go? I am. K favors like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Join me on Patreon at patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see my original art. You can see how I make the comics that I make. You can download my out-of-print hard-to-find zines and mini-comics. All that and a lot more at patreon.com slash jimrug. Red Room is coming out on a monthly basis. You could order or pre-order your comics at the Fantagraphic website. You could get there uh, by way of my link tree in the description below this video. Uh, another link in that link tree is to my Patreon if you want to read these comics digitally ahead of time. Uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks gets you the archive there. And there are over 100 pages right now. As we speak with new pages every Tuesday. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we have going on and coming out this year. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video as well. Jimmy, give him one less set of merchant orders, man. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.